excited to be here. Um, also slightly disappointed in that uh, there's a perfectly good piano over there, and no presenters have sung along with their presentations, so just some feedback for next year, maybe. Um, so my name is Frank Cifaldi. I'm uh, the founder and the co-director of the Video Game History Foundation. Uh, we are a nonprofit uh, located in the United States focused on uh, preserving the history of video games. Um, if we have a mission statement, it's something like this. It's, we want to make sure that historians and storytellers have what they need to tell the story of video games. Um, and uh, this actually was inspired by uh, my life and career in video games, um, which goes back quite a, quite a ways. Uh, so um, my career in archiving video game history uh, starts in the late 90s uh, on the internet. Um, where I uh, was uh, liberating software from its original media and uh, putting it freely on the internet, or in other words, I was a software pirate. Um, and I think even back then, um, I might not have used the word preservation or archiving, but I think I understood that I was uh, saving a, a volatile uh, art medium uh, from disappearing from the world by, uh, by pirating the hell out of it. Um, but weirdly enough, because I was doing that and I was starting to get interested in contextualizing these games and, and, and uh, exposing their stories along with their files, um, I started uh, a website called Lost Levels in 2003, which was actually the first website ever dedicated to spotlighting video games that were worked on, possibly even completed, but never sold commercially. Uh, things that were, you know, maybe stuck in a programmer's garage or were sent to a magazine for review before it got canceled, uh, things like that. And because I was writing up those stories, I started uh, getting attention from the video game industry, positive attention, and it led to an actual career in the video game industry. So I think I might be one of the only people who got into the video game industry through pirating the video game industry, I don't know. Um, so I was a journalist for a number of years. Uh, I was an editor at a website called Gama Sutra, um, which is a, a video game peer-to-peer -peer industry site. I also did consumer work, I reviewed uh, pretty terrible Game Boy Advance games for a Nintendo official magazine. Um, I edited a website called oneup.com uh, for a couple of years in the States. Um, ended up at a company called GameTap, which was uh, uh, a subscription-based games-on-demand service in 2006, where you would pay a monthly fee to get digital access to content. Uh, brand new idea at the time. Uh, that uh, I think sort of paved the way for things like Netflix, uh, but unfortunately for us, we went out of business very quickly. Um, and then uh, eventually transitioned into game development uh, at a studio called Other Ocean, uh, and then later with our sub-label Digital Eclipse, where we actually brought back classic video games back in print uh, in a sort of like Criterion Collection version. Uh, I, I speak in past tense as if it's done, we're still going. We're, we, we have a new product coming out like next month. Um, but uh, through all of this, uh, you know, even though I wasn't, you know, doing that same sort of preservation work that I was doing as a, a pirate teenager, um, all of my work tends to veer back toward history, toward preserving history, toward exposing interesting stories from video games past. And this is an example uh, of... Uh, a story I wrote on Gama Sutra to illustrate just the shambles that video game history is in, which is that uh, it is impossible to substantiate the release date of Super Mario Brothers. We don't know the day that Super Mario Brothers came out. We know when it came out in Japan, to be clear, but we don't know when it came out anywhere else, uh, especially in the United States, where this is the game that is often credited with saving the entire video game industry. This is the game that many, including myself, would argue, wrote the template for the modern video game. And I couldn't tell you when it was first sold. Uh, I spent two weeks on this article calling everyone I know, making Toys R Us dig through their corporate records, things like that, um, and I just could not substantiate it. Um, and then, uh, it, and, and it, 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 we can't rely on company archives either. I mean, Nintendo 
you know, they, they, they didn't help me because they're Nintendo. But, um, but th this is an example of, of how even company archives just can't be trusted for saving their own history. Uh, this, is, this is a game called Micon Block. Um, and this came from a Digital Eclipse production uh, that I produced called the SNK 40th Anniversary Collection. Now, SNK is a Japanese company, been around since the 70s, they're still around. And the point of this product we were making with them was to capture their 40-year history in this sort of anthology. Um, Micon Block was the first SNK game. We're celebrating the 40-year history of SNK. We want to show their first game. They don't have it. Nobody has it. Uh, we had to rely on just digging like wherever we could to even know what that game was. Uh, this isn't a game that you can like download and play in MAME or anything like that. Uh, there, this isn't a game that's still in like vintage arcades. We we can't substantiate that this company's first game still exists in this world. Um, so. We had to rely on things like bad photocopies of an ad that, w that were in a Japanese library. Um, so over here is, I mean, it's like, you know, look at the, the screenshot. It's, it's, it's like looking at Bigfoot or something, right? It's like, <laughs> this, is, this is a video game from the 70s that was widely distributed and it's just gone from the world. Um, so again, the, the Video Game History Foundation, which I founded three years ago, uh, I'm just trying to sort of stop the bleeding and I'm trying to make things easier for historians or for other storytellers to be able to access this kinds of material and tell their stories. Um, so we have three pillars. Uh, we tried to make an acronym out of them, but I don't know if, which one is worse, P or APE. Um, but, uh, we focus on uh, preserving history, obviously, on education, on advocacy. Um, so the, the education part, you know, we... we Contextualize games, which is something I've been doing my whole career, but you know, uh, now uh, encourage other authors to do through our website. Uh, we are uh, what I call industry advocates, which is we're trying to stop that situation that we just saw on the previous slide and, and help uh, game companies to ensure that their own legacies are around in the future. Um, and of course, you know, we, we are a digital archive, but what I want to talk about today is our physical archive. Um, Again, we want to give people the tools that they need to tell the story of games, so what do they need? They probably need games, right? So maybe we should make a video game library. Maybe we should you know, collect every single video game ever made just to make sure people have access to them. And um, you know, a lot of people see this slide and their like, eyes light up. That's a, that's a nightmare scenario to me. Uh, like the, 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 the idea of upkeeping all of these games, and it's not just like, okay, we have a copy of, you know, I don't know, Sonic the Hedgehog. It's like, well, do we need the Japanese version? Do we need, you know, the version that was localized in other languages to make sure that that's available? Uh, how far do we take this, and how much storage space do we need in Oakland, California, which is something like the third most expensive city in America? Uh, nightmare scenario, but it's not just the games, right? It's, these games have to play. Uh, do we have to maintain all of this Antique hardware. Um, do we, you know, do we, do we have to make sure that all of them, all of this stuff is working? That we can set up a researcher uh, with the games. Uh, that that uh, you know we, we can at any given moment uh, bring the game to someone to make sure that they can play it and study it. Um, and this is this is just home stuff, right? I mean. About arcade machines. Uh, do we need to go collect every single arcade cabinet in the world that was ever made to make sure that they're around, that they exist? Um, no. <laughs> uh, this this is an excessive archive, right? Like, how do how do how do we deal with this? Uh, the way we deal with this is that we don't. <laughs> we don't. The Video Game History Foundation doesn't collect video games, um, which is something that I think surprises a lot of people, but. There are good reasons for this. Uh, the first one being that people who study video game history, we know how to pirate this stuff. We know how to play it on emulators, on our computers. We can get at it, and we don't necessarily need a library to access them. Now, I'm ignoring things like, uh, like digital artwork that, that could be considered a game, right? That, 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 that can't be stored in a physical medium or you know, online games, flash games, things like that. But, 
if we're speaking strictly of games that were sold physically, I, I just don't think it's necessary. I think that uh, every historian I know, we know how to find the games. We, we know where all the secret ROM stashes are. Um, but even if that weren't the case, video game collecting is uh, such a popular hobby right now that I'm not worried about physical archives disappearing from the world. Uh, my hope is that a lot of these collectors end up becoming donors to another institution, and there are other institutions. There are libraries that are collecting video games currently. Um, my favorite being the Strong Museum of Play in Rochester. So there is this notion, uh, as you're seeing here, of this physical archive of every video game ever made. Here are two of the curators uh, pretending to look at uh, their complete collection of uh, Japanese Mega Drive games. So, this is a problem that's already solved. We're not going to deal with it because we don't have to. Uh, instead, uh, what we, we focus on are the sort of ephemeral things around playing the game. So what I like to say is that we're trying to capture how games were played and discussed and how they were made. Uh, and so our entire focus is uh, on those two things and what that looks like right now is that uh, we're storing the, the sort of world record uh, the world's record of, of what critics thought of games by collecting the video game magazines, for example, uh, and the books, and uh, things like uh, the production material that went into these magazines even. We've gone as far as to uh, acquire some of the original layout files for magazines going back to the 90s so that the, uh, you know, the, the, the screenshots can be extracted from them, for example. Um, or the original... Uh, publisher art that was sent to the magazines digitally. We, we, we try to track those down so that uh, we can contextualize like what the media had access to when they might have been talking about a game. And then the second wing of our archive um, is basically developer archives. Like we go around to people who have been in the industry for a while who stole from work basically and took things home, took home their work and, and, uh, and kept it. And so things like... Uh, design documentation, original concept art, things like that. Um, and um, most importantly, the, the uh, actual like source code, the, the digital uh, uh, building blocks of the games themselves so that, we can, uh, so that people can study them uh, really intricately, can understand how they work by going directly into the code and, and, and poking around and even uh, possibly you know, modifying the game and, and understanding how it works better. Um, and uh, what we like to say is, you know, play your game somewhere else, but come here to study them. Uh, so this is uh, an example. This is Disney's Aladdin uh, on the Mega Drive. Um, we don't host the game itself, uh, but we do have, for example, a lot of the uh, artwork that was used to animate the sprites from Disney Animation. We have every magazine that ever reviewed this game, so you can get a, a sort of critical consensus of, of what people thought of it and how the game was advertised to players at the time. And then we also happen to have the source code, the source material, and the tools used to make the game. So you can, you know, you can bring up the original soundtrack of the game and, 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 and understand how that worked and, and, and what was used to compose it and maybe get a, gain a better understanding of the, the limitations of the tools and why certain decisions were made. Or the animation tools, uh, we, we allow uh, people to, to bring that up uh, with the original animation art and, and sort of understand that part of the game as well. Um, so I guess if, if I have a piece of advice, I mean, th this doesn't just, you know, pertain to people running archives like ours. I think this is good advice in general. It's just scale to your budget. I don't have infinite space. I can't host these video games. And uh, we can't, you know, just have like ROMs and emulators on site because all of this work is copyrighted, unfortunately, because it's too recent. Um, find your niche, right? Find what you can best contribute to the world uh, instead of trying to do everything at once. Uh, and finally, for I, I think this is really good advice too. If you're if you're embarking uh, on a journey like mine, where uh, you, you don't really have enough funding to pay yourself, is at least have fun. Um, you know, find find what you can have the most impact on uh, and, and uh, sort of realize that if you're having fun doing it, you're going to be productive and do more of it. Um, I have exactly 25 seconds left, so thank you very much. I'll leave you with that. <laughs>